you know Karl Popper uh, was also very uh, fascinated i would say lover of music and his mother inculcated him in him such a passion for music that for a time he contemplated taking it up as of as a career and he initially chose the history of music as a second subject for his phd so let me just uh, share the screen thank you so much for your uh, kind of uh, presence uh, dear and respected friend i randhir kumar gautam on behalf of vishwanidan center for asian blossoming welcome you to attend today's session on the eve of 120th anniversary of karl popper's birth it's a great pleasure and indeed an honor to have available to us distinguished speakers professor philip benet from department and chair uh, from uh, lebanon valley college usa i welcome uh, mr luik castel professor gyan gului dr mn sri and all our respected friends participants i extend my warm welcome to professor anand giri mentor of uh, us and uh, honorary trustee of vishnidan center for asian blossoming and all our friends present uh, virtually from facebook you facebook platform and youtube platform uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for your kind participation let me give a brief introduction of uh, professor uh, philip uh, professor philip is a department chair and associate professor of political science and is also director of pre law program and uh, director of external fellowship at lebanon valley college uh, he is a, a deep reader of uh, karl popper's work and uh, he has also reviewed the open society and its enemy uh, and that is uh, also published uh, uh, in terms of book uh, so thank so on behalf of the snedan center for asian blossoming we are very grateful that he accepted our invitation let me also give a brief introduction of swadhyay sah chakra that is our circle of co learnings and mutual studies it is an initiative of studying and learning together self culture societies and the world friends associated with this are eager to walk and mediate with new horizons of thinking and new movements of social cultural change at work in our contemporary world we are study seekers such as sri arvindo mahatma gandhi chitranjan das a creative thinker from orissa and many others from the from around the world we also present our own writings and reflect upon our creativity together we also invite seekers from different fields of life to share with us their lives visions sadhana and struggles for creating a world of beauty dignity and i know we meet every sunday or sometimes on wednesday we have collaborations with different institutions in india and abroad and we look for your kind participation and also to be our co nurturer uh karl popper is really one of the revolutionary thinker of our time and he was born on 28 july 1902 uh he was an australian british austrian british philosopher and professor at great uh, london school of economics he is generally uh, regarded as one of the greatest philosophers of science in 20th century uh but uh, a very ignored philosopher uh of course we uh, know all his writings when we study mythology but we really ignored his uh, philosophy when it comes to understanding his 
uh, uh, concepts for that matter. And Karl Popper, Karl Popper writes uh, in his biography that uh, he was the happiest philosopher. And he knew uh, most philosophers are really uh, deeply depressed. And he explained because they can't uh, produce anything worthwhile. Uh, so uh, with this brief introduction, first I would like to invite Professor Anand Giri to kindly give a brief introduction of uh, today's talk, and then we'll invite our respected. Thank you, dear Anandi, and thank you, and a warm welcome to Professor Benesh. And all friends co present, uh, Mr. Loka Stylen, Kang, Binati, and many friends co present this evening. What a joy to be together on this birthday of Karl Popper. And uh, some of us have read his work, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And open society, creating an open society is a perennial journey. And that open society requires not only permanent revolution, but a path of permanent critic, creativity and transformations. And it is in this context, Professor Bennett's work on Popper is deeply significant as he invites us, uh, as he presents us Socrates, as a way of understanding proper. And Professor Benes finds a lot of resonance between Socrates and proper. So that Socrat Socratic modality of being is so important. The ability to ask questions, keep the fields open. And uh, Professor Benes also presents many important challenging insights. For example, in the preface, he writes about that how much of the philosophical work has been kind of closed within an intellectual history frame. And the real task of political theorizing needs to be realized. <clears throat> and that is a very important point. Though theorizing itself, including political theorizing, also fruitfully builds on a creative alliance between history of ideas and the contemporary. And uh, that the glimpse of that we see in the work of Foucault and also in the work of a great seeker like Fred Dalmayar, where intellectual history is not just intellectual history, but it is related to very creative modality of theorizing, but that theorizing needs to be linked to practices of transformation, transformative politics, transformative ways of being, a transformational science. Therefore, Professor Bennett's exploration of limits of positivism in Popper and what he calls as post-positivist, you know, trends. And this is so important. From the Indian side, we also have very interesting reflections on limits of philosophy of science, especially positivism. And uh, possibly Professor Bennett's work can open up these kind of cross theoretical conversations. For example, I have in mind here the very important work of a great Indian philosopher R. Sundar Rajan, who more than 20 years ago, in his Beyond the Crisis of European Sciences, he talks about three post positivist terms. One is the feminist term, the other is the linguistic term. And that linguistic term is an open ended term. And in his preface, Professor Bennett refers to Wittgenstein, for example. And, uh, and it seems that uh, Professor Benedge finds not so adequate Wittgenstein's engagement with the whole field. But it would be very interesting 
to also explore the kind of the Viennese framework, which the Viennese space, which gave, out, gave so many brilliant minds. You know, Wittgenstein is one, Popper, and there are many others, you know. So coming back to Sundar Rajan's work on post-positivism and this linguistic term, the feminist term, and the ecological term, to which we can also add the whole onto decolonial term. And also I would like to present a spiritual term. And so as we look forward to listening to Professor Bennett, some of these uh, themes may be further explored. For example, the spiritual dimension in the cultivation of an open society, the spiritual di dimension in the Socratic pathway. And this whole colonial challenge is also deeply significant in terms of how conventional uh, philosophy of science is also not isolated from a kind of colonization of the world. And so therefore the critique of positive science must also involve a critique of colonialism, you know, whether it is known or unknown, you know, colonialism by other means. So, so these are some of the thoughts I just had initially, and we eagerly look forward to be enriched by Professor Bennett. Thank you very much. Uh, sh shall I um, respond and, and, and begin my presentation? First of all, can I make sure everybody can hear me? I'm, I'm uh, wondering whether I'm... Uh, yes, you are audible. audible. Thank you very much. Can I begin by re immediately responding to a couple of the points that were raised in the introduction, uh, which was fascinating and which I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and I do feel honored to be with you all today. Um, and I, I then have a couple of bits and pieces to say beyond that, but I, but I particularly wanted to respond to uh, three or four things uh, that were mentioned. Uh, so let, let me begin by uh, ethics and, and the purpose of your center, which I think is absolutely admirable. Um, I think if you want to understand Karl Popper's uh, orientation in politics, it is an orientation to the rejection of violence. It is an orientation to the rejection of groupthink uh, and the exclusion of others and the attempt to compel others who are not part of your group to become um, conform to, to align or to conform with your group if necessary by force. What Popper wanted to do was to develop what he called, and we can discuss whether this is an adequate term or a, a, an adequate framework, but he called critical rationalism. And critical rationalism starts with the rejection of fists and pistols as the way to, to, to settle disputes. Unless, you know, if someone comes at you with a fist or a pistol, you, you, have, you may well have to defend yourself, but um, the preference is for reasoned argument. And for Popper, from the earliest years through to his um, end years, you know, right through, uh, for example, in the Open Society and its Enemies, which uh, has been mentioned uh, already, uh, which was published, was written during the Second World War. It was, the first volume was finished in 1942, the second volume in 1943, right through to his, uh, the last publication that he prepared just before he died, The Myth of the Framework, there is this credo that runs through Popper, which is the idea that you may be right, I may be wrong, but only by working together, by talking together, can we begin to come a little closer to the truth. So it's a recognition, this is an ethical attitude, which starts with a humble recognition of our own fallibility our own as human beings, as individuals, likely to have a partial, relative, fragmented view that is not the whole truth that we believe it to be, and that we have to humbly engage with others rather than simply compelling others or converting them at the point of force. So that's the first thing which I really picked up upon when you were talking about the, uh, the center and the, the wonderful work that you do and how that might correspond with Karl Popper. The other thing, I was very interested that you, you start with a, a clip of music uh, from um, 
with, with the Viennese theme. I, I think that this is telling of Popper as well. Um, Popper, as you say, uh, was an accomplished musician when he was young, uh, but then every other person in Vienna was an accomplished musician, so he couldn't make a living from that. And uh, uh, there, there were many other uh, talents that he had, but he always had this lifelong fascination with music. And during the period when he was in exile from Vienna, he um, missed, badly missed the Viennese musical tradition. He got hold of a, of a number of um, the, the, uh, the, the, the various parts of uh, various musical recordings made by American orchestras, which he was able to get while he was in exile in the, the, um, uh, the, the, the um, in New Zealand. And he was so disappointed by what he heard. He, he um, suddenly discovered that the Americans playing the same music had an entirely different musical uh, tradition, a different interpretation, a different uh, performative standard that they were employing. Uh, so, so there is this uh, initial um, uh, ver very uh, interesting problem with Popper that, that uh, um, there, there is this disappointment. And he lived most of his uh, life after the age of about 36. He lived most of his life outside of Austria. Um, so a good two thirds of his life was lived, lived in exile and often in a um, distinct uh, cultural environment, which he was not entirely at home in, I think. That, that's also important. Can I uh, also touch upon the, the introductory, introductory statements of these various post-positivist paths, which I, I thought was very interesting. Um, and I think we probably will need to come back and discuss this in greater detail uh, towards the end of this, um, th this discussion. I, you know, I, I'm not here as the expert, I'm here as a participant to learn as well as to exchange my ideas. But I, but I would suggest that there is from the outset a sharp distinction with, uh, between Wittgenstein and Popper's um, in their early encounters. And they never really got over their early encounter. Um, the early Wittgenstein, the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus was held up by the Vienna Circle and by many others as a uh, example of, um, of, of, of positivism. It, it was seen as, as a positivist work. And Popper's disagreements with Wittgenstein never really recovered from that early association of Wittgenstein with a kind of enhanced positivism and Wittgenstein's efforts subsequently to kind of cover over the traces of positivism and try and construct something that was um, supposedly different. Uh, I, I think, uh, we again, we can have some uh, conversation about that. Um, I view Popper primarily, as I say, as a, an ethical theorist. Uh, he develops, of course, very important insight in the philosophy of science, but the philosophy of science should be seen as derivative of that ethical commitment to um, establish ways of having a conversation about what we each claim to be the truth, uh, a conversation without us uh, going to war. And, and much of his uh, early writings on the philosophy of science come from that ethical commitment. Before he was uh, interested, or sorry, before he was fully committed to the philosophy of science, he had associated himself with politics. And his earliest political involvement, in fact, was an involvement with Marxism, one of his earliest uh, political involvements, I should say. So at the age of 16 or thereabouts in, um, uh, in 1917, um, 1918, um, Popper became increasingly associated with the Marxists. Now, he, he was associated from a very young age with a number of Austrian socialists who were already committed to a kind of revisionist Marxist approach. But in the, the excitement of 1917 and 1918, with the increasing dismay at the prolongation of the war that Austria was fighting along with Germany um, against other countries, um, Popper became increasingly drawn into a, a Marxism that was subsequently attracted to a Leninist so-called communist approach. I say so-called communist because 
uh, in my view, it has nothing actually to do with either Marxism or indeed um, uh, communism, but rather is this very different ideology, which I would prefer to just label Leninism. But for a brief period, he was attracted to the Austrian communists who were Leninists, who were um, uh, impressed by the Russian Revolution and by Lenin's gradual ascent to power. Uh, he, they were particularly impressed by the, um, uh, the, the, the ability of, of the new Soviet regime to withdraw from that First World War through the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was one of the earliest acts of the new Bolshevik government. You know, in March of 1918, they signed a peace treaty. They conceded huge amounts of territory from the Russian Empire, which was uh, a necessary uh, exchange in order to save lives, in order to save peace and uh, avoid further bloodshed. And Popper admired Lenin and Trotsky when they engaged in those peace-seeking, life-preserving uh, circumstances. You must remember again that he was a 16, 17-year-old in Vienna, a male about to come to military age where he could easily be called up for military service. He wanted that war over, not only, however, for his own self-interest, but also because uh, the war had been so incredibly dismally um, corrosive of, of human um, of, of human well-being. It, it was a sign of human suffering. Uh, Popper was deeply moved by the need to avoid human suffering. Unnecessary human suffering should be avoided at all costs. And he saw war as an example of largely unnecessary human suffering. I mean, if absolutely you have to, uh, if you're under attack, if there is a Nazi regime, as he found uh, some 20 years later, then you have to resist the Nazis because uh, the Nazis will not uh, adhere to a, uh, a dialogue based on reason. But ultimately, um, as Karl Marx said, at some point, the force of logic gives way to the logic of force. Um, but those are exceptional circumstances, hopefully, that we can achieve uh, uh, instead a critical, rational uh, engagement with others that, that avoids that. Um, so, so avoid suffering, and not just suffering in, in terms of the extremes of war, but also ordinary human suffering that is found in a whole host of contexts, uh, especially if in the aftermath of the war, Austria was in a mess economically, as was Germany, as were many other countries as they transitioned from a war economy that had been all consuming to a situation in which uh, that the economies were in many instances experienced mass unemployment, massive uh, dislocation, starvation in some instances, certainly a shortage of good food, a shortage of adequate food, I should say, and um, all the destruction to the economy had also left the housing crisis. The suffering of ordinary people in uh, Vienna, the suffering that he indeed saw throughout much of the Western part of Europe was something that, that, that uh, Popper believed was the most urgent human problem that needed to be addressed. You could not leave this to the free market. You could not leave this to the alleged benevolence and beneficence of entrepreneurs. You could not do what the laissez-faire um, advocates in, in economics thought you could do. You needed a society-wide response and you needed to recognize that human suffering, human misery was the core of the core moral claim that can be made upon us. This doesn't need to be in uh, Kantian, uh, Kantian morality or Kantian ethics. It doesn't need to be expressed in utilitarian terms. It was simply a response, he believed, to what one could see as the suffering all around us, the material suffering. Now, remember that Popper was coming to this position as a Marxist, as someone who at least associated with Marxism, whether he would be uh, a Marxist in a, in a, you know, if you were to take a, a set of theoretical commitments and measure them against the Popper that we find in um, 1917 or all the way through to the mid 1930s, I think <laughs> you may find that he was not, he doesn't measure up uh, as a Marxist uh, in these particular ways. Um, but 
he was somebody who recognized that the proletariat, the working class who earned their living through wage labor, was the most vulnerable. And their suffering was the suffering that commanded or ought to command the most immediate moral attention. Now, I say Popper was a Marxist. I talked about Popper being attracted to communism. He very rapidly became disabused of communism. He had thrown himself into the communist movement um, as much as a 17 or 16 year old could do so. But then he found that the communists were no better in many respects than the capitalist manipulative ruling class that he had come to criticize. The communists he found in particular were willing to mobilize the working class in order to confront superior armed force knowing that many workers' heads would be broken if they rioted, knowing that many would suffer the, sh the shots fired by the guns of the much better armed police and army that would be mobilized to defend the existing state. And so Popper saw that although the communists uh, had seemed to be a much more promising moral way forward when he was 16, he rapidly became disillusioned with those. And by 1919, he had broken with the communists. He remained part of the Socialist Democratic Party in, in Germany, which had a very strong Marxist orientation. He was uh, very good friends with many who would describe themselves as socialist revisionists or communist, or sorry, sorry, Marxist revisionists, people who followed Edward Bernstein and his approach to evolutionary socialism. Indeed, I think Popper's own work is to a very, very substantial extent, a development of Bernstein's approach. Bernstein's criticism of deficiencies in the Marxian conception of history, Bernstein's criticism directly of certain key chapters within uh, Marx's Das Kapital are almost replicated in Popper's equivalent chapters in the Open Society and its Enemies. So I think there's a very close connection, but there's also immediate connection with um, the younger Adler, uh, there's an immediate, there's a direct connection with the two Brownthal brothers. Um, the two Brownthal brothers were active within the Socialist Party. Um, uh, the the uh, one went on to write the definitive, so far as there is a definitive, a definitive history of the Second International, and uh, he um, advanced there um, a view that was not uncritical, that recognized the uh, deficiencies that had of, of the policies and of the um, adherence to principle of many of the socialists. So that's one of the Brownfell brothers. The other Brownfell brother, Alfred Brownfell, was a lifelong friend of Popper. He continued to be in correspondence with Popper uh, during the Second World War and immediately after. Popper continued to work with him and, and share uh, intellectual projects with him. And indeed, when Alfred, um, uh, when, when he went to the United States, uh, he tried, while Popper was in New Zealand, he tried to ensure that um, Popper's work might actually be published in the United States. And he was one of the individuals who Popper asked to promote to a publisher um, the possibility of publishing his Open Society and its Enemies, something that uh, was not readily publishable in the context of the Second World War, where everything was compressed, where, where, where paper and ink were both rationed and where publishers were quite uh, averse to taking too many risks on new publication adventures. So, uh, but, but the Brownsdale brothers remain close to Popper. Indeed, um, uh, the, the, uh, Alfred Brownsdale, if I remember his name correctly, uh, was the person whose Brussels home was the location for Popper's first reading of a draft of the poverty of historicism. The very first draft that Popper made of that writing in 1936 um, was read at the Brussels home of Brownfell. Before Popper then went back to England where he'd been spending a sabbatical year from his teaching, his school teaching job in, in Vienna, he went back to England and he then presented a kind of second reading of that paper to the uh, Hayek seminar at the LSE. So first Brownfeld, the, 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 the revisionist socialist, and then uh, Hayek 
were the um, persons who, who um, uh, achieved um, some, some initial reception of Popper. And both of, the, both of those remained close to Popper throughout the Second World War. Both of them tried to secure publication of his Open Society and its Enemies. And uh, as, as probably many of you know, it was Hayek who ultimately succeeded in helping Popper out. And I, I think many people assume that Popper became a kind of Hayekian. That I think is absolutely incorrect. I think that uh, he was very grateful to Hayek. Hayek, uh, while Popper spent the war years in New Zealand, Hayek ultimately helped him, number one, get his book, The Open Society and Cinemas, a two volume massive manuscript before a publisher, namely Routledge, um, and its editor there, who became quite enthusiastic for it and did indeed publish it in 1945. Hayek also edited at the LSE, edited a journal called Economica, and, the, and Economica published in three installments the uh, four parts of the, of the poverty of historicism. So on those two areas, Hayek clearly helped Popper out when Popper was stuck in New Zealand during the Second World War and ultimately grew rather desperate about getting out from New Zealand. And then um, he, he also helped him to get an interview and a job at the LSE. And their, their friendship, their collaboration continued, but it, I think it is a mistake to assume that Popper and Hayek were in lockstep. In fact, often they were not. And uh, through private criticism, rarely through public statements, Popper was critical of Hayek's approach. Popper wanted uh, a coalition of the left with the liberals, whereas um, both Hayek and von Mises, who, who uh, many of you may have heard of as, as, as an Austrian school theorist, um, were absolutely opposed to the inclusion of the, uh, the left. So that, for example, when Hayek and von Mises organized the Montpelleron Society, Popper insisted that the left be invited, and <laughs> they weren't, uh, because uh, von Mises and, and Hayek uh, did not want to build the bridges that Popper wanted to build. I think of Popper as someone whose early uh, involvement in the socialist movement, and he remained a member of the Socialist Party of Austria right through until he left Austria for the first time in 1935, so just after the moment where the Austrian fascists took over the running of the country of Austria um, and you established the Dolphus and Schuschnigg regimes in Austria. Right through to that point, Popper was a socialist. He would have defined himself as a socialist. He would have continued to define himself as a socialist if socialism had, in his view, uh, continued to be able to learn from the um, theoretical errors that, that it had um, committed itself to in the past. In other words, he would have been prepared to look at a revisionist socialism, just as Bernstein and the Braunfell brothers had also advanced a revisionist version. I think also that you should recognize that Popper continued to admire Marx. He viewed especially the early Marx as offering a humanistic and activist approach to solving human problems. The most urgent issue before philosophers was not to sit in their armchairs and contemplate the world, as Marx says in the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, but rather, as Popper praises him for that, uh, in, rather it is to change the world. Popper praised the activist element in Marxism, but at the same time criticized what he saw as the um, entrapment of Marxism in a number of contrary tendencies. First was a kind of positivist entrapment of Marxism, that Marxism uh, adopted a scientific approach where they assumed that they had a method that was absolutely foolproof in achieving the um, uh, recognition of, of the course of history, um, and that they were overly impressed with a kind of deterministic, closed, um, supposedly um, empirical driven um, approach to, to this. Uh, for, for Popper, Empirical science is very important, but the, the role of empirical science, or the, the role of, of facts and of data, is to offer us possible indications of our own error. It is, in other words, not to confirm, not to build by inductivist means a 
supposedly solid case uh, that, that we have a vision of history, uh, we have a, 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 an analysis of current contemporary capitalism, but rather we look for the anomalies, we look for the elements, the facts that ought to enable us to question our uh, assumptions and in particular question the certitude with which we hold certain theories and certain facts, uh, certain approaches rather, rather than assuming, holding onto them dogmatically. Um, so, so there is a need, he believed, to help Marxism grow beyond that kind of positivist, determinist entombment. And along with that, there was a need for Marxism to free itself from the remnants of Hegelianism. And I think this is something that, uh, going back to the introductory comments uh, that were made, I think this is a very important point in um, Popper, because there, there is interestingly enough, various parts of the left that have been critical of Leninism, as Popper was, that have been critical of the failures of the, of the non-Leninist left. But what they have often done is they have gone back to Hegelianized Marxism. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of the Frankfurt School of Adorno, who retreated all the way from even effectively abandoning the idea that the proletariat was the, the key class to transform society. So the Frankfurt scholars, whether Adorno or Habermas, or sorry, not Habermas, Horkheimer, or um, uh, Marcuse, also a little bit of the early Habermas, but the later Habermas is, is slightly different, I think, from, from, from the Frankfurt School mainstream. But, but I think that, that you have there um, a very clear difference with Popper. Popper um, thought that the uh, continued legacy and entrapment of uh, Marxism in, in that framework was not healthy. Um, so there, that's one set of observations I would make. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple of other elements here. So, so I talked about, um, you, you mentioned a Socratic approach in the, the your introduction. And I think that is indeed critical to Popper. Now, the crucial point about Socrates is that Socrates had become lost in history. He had become um, appropriated by a vision of the past that was seen through platonic lenses. And one of the interesting things about the open society and its enemies, which is an attempt, I think, very substantially to help the left recover from some of the errors that had led the left to, to accommodate Marxism, sorry, to accommodate fascism and to accommodate um, the, the uh, to, to fail to, to thwart the rise of, of the Nazis. Um, part, part of um, what, what you find in the Open Society and its enemies is that the entire first volume is really an attempt to reclaim a vision of a Socratic approach to ethics and to epistemology. It is uh, in Socrates that Popper finds a refreshing fallibilistic approach, but also an approach not only to, to epistemology that is fallibilistic, but also an approach to ethics that uh, I, I think he regarded as um, capable of revitalizing the left. Um, uh, again, an effort on to avoid unnecessary harm and, an, uh, and a conscious effort to recognize uh, through the recognition of our own uh, fallibility, a, a humble approach to, to the need to, uh, to engage in dialogue, to question, to question everything, to question experts in particular, rather than to trust necessarily experts when they are uh, opining outside of their fields, um, but, it, but indeed to, to question everything rather than to have a, a deferential and authoritarian view of the experts. Um, so, I, so I think um, the, the two parts of the Open Society and its enemies are closely connected. The, the second volume very largely focuses on Marxism, but the second volume is preceded necessarily, of course, by the first volume, which, which uh, looks, looks at the reclaiming of a Socratic view. Um, the, in, the in the introduction, you said we need to recognize a new connection between history and contemporary activity. And I could not 
agree with you more. I, I fully agree with, with that. And I think that is indeed what Popper was doing. If you read the very introduction to the logic of scientific discovery, he actually talks about replacing the positivist method with a historical method. And by that, he meant an attempt to recover and to um, imaginatively recreate the problem situations, that is to say the theoretical frameworks and the problems, the way, the way theoretical problems would be dealt with by each uh, of the various scientists so that we better understand the history of science as it informs uh, the, the development of science. So far from Popper being a historicist, or sorry, a historical, um, Popper was committed to, to, to a new approach to historical methods in the course of both scientific in inquiries and indeed other inquiries. Um, and so the, and if you look at the Open Society in Zenos, it is a work of historical reclamation. He reclaims a vision of Marx that is free from the positivist and historicist entanglements. He reclaims a vision of uh, Socrates that is free from platonic entanglements. Um, this is a work that is deeply interested in history and in the use of history to offer alternative narratives to what we currently have taken as uh, uh, often unquestioningly as the basis of, of traditions and, and, and of um, traditions that lead to present intellectual commitments. So um, I think I would connect with the uh, introduction there. I would also uh, connect with your references to decoloniality. And I would offer a couple of points about that. First and foremost, often those who talk about decoloniality end up colonizing themselves. Um, so, so I'm a little concerned that, but, but I think you're absolutely right. What Popper, uh, contrary to most of the ways in which he is presented, what Popper was opposed to was the imperialism of science as conceived of as a positive enterprise. Um, science is to be, in some sense, dethroned. There is no veneration of the experts by Popper. There is instead a demand that experts, including scientific experts, um, be held effectively to, uh, to, to, to a, I was going to say to account. What, what we want them to be is to be able to be, con their, their arguments to be contested that they are not automatically assumed to be correct. This is the exact opposite. Popper's position is the exact opposite of an imperialism of science. But it is also, I think, very much in recognition of the exclusion of large areas of the world from Western scientific conceptions, uh, a recognition that those conceptions were constructed in a, um, a particular historical context, a particular cultural context, and are often unable to see the true picture, the full picture that only could be uh, established um, through, 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 through a more inclusive and more critically uh, inclusive approach. Um, and the other, one other point that I wanted to connect with the introductory comment uh, with, was with respect to a spiritual side. Now, here you and I may differ quite substantially. <laughs> um, I, I tend to see Popper as almost a materialist. And in, in that respect, he, uh, no, he, he calls himself a humanist. He calls himself a dualist in his early work. Um, in his later work, he refers to a pluralism of, in which um, human minds, mater the material world, and ideas coexist at three different parts of, of the picture rather than just a kind of monistic uh, single source. Um, but in all effects, in all, all intents and purposes, what Popper was, was someone who was working very largely within a materialist tradition, I think. Uh, he was, certainly wasn't a, a, an idealist position. There is no indication of um, any real sympathy with uh, a theological concern, a religious concern. Um, there is no concession to what generally and often is referred to as uh, a spiritualist approach or spiritual approach. He does uh, talk about the fact that you know, one has to recognize the existence of ideas and that human beings are not simply bundles of flesh and blood 
uh, and, and interest that there is also, um, often we are motivated by ideas that lead us along courses of action that we would not otherwise, simply by pursuing our appetites or passions, be, be inclined to, to pursue. Um, so there is an autonomy of ideas that he recognizes. Then there is an autonomy um, of ethics that, that, that can um, uh, regulate our action. Um, we, we, he sometimes referred to this as plastic control by ideas, these regulatory norms, um, which are not to say that they, are, they exercise a cast iron determinist control over our actions, but that we have certain commitments to values to ideas, to norms that regulate our conduct, and that our conduct would not simply be explainable as a determinist might try to explain it. And our conduct would not be explainable simply as the result of certain purely uh, biochemical processes or certain other such processes that uh, are reductive and um, disregard the influence of ideas. However, however, um, that, that's still a long way from, from a full accommodation of, of what often is referred to as a spiritual approach. I think that uh, Popper was always very careful never to offend the religious. He was very careful not to upset any religious sensibilities. I mean, this goes all the way back to his um, origins in, in Austria. Austria was a predominantly Catholic country. His parents were Jewish. Uh, but his parents converted to Lutheranism to lessen the offense to the Catholic majority. Uh, and Popper himself was always very concerned that one not offend the religious sensibilities of any group of people. Um, he spoke always with respect and with deference, but not ever endorsing a position. He, he recognized the ethical values that will often be found in those religious positions, but he does not um, adopt them. Um, Popper's view, which is in the early part of his work, very much influenced by Marxism, is largely a materialist perspective, I think. His criticism of Plato in the first volume is almost a Marxist class-based criticism of Plato. And his arguments about Marx do not treat Marx as a crude materialist, but as someone who in effect recognized, putting Marx to have recognized um, a, a dualist position, a position in which ideas and our material processes are sometimes in tension uh, within ourselves, that is, not, not, not just in, uh, in the broader society. In Popper's latest, later work, I think he takes this position to a much greater level. And, and I think he is actually quite brilliant in his later works in what he uh, tries to map out very tentatively, uh, very humbly as a three world um, ontology, uh, one might call it, although he was rather um, wary of calling it an ontology, but, but effectively that is what he is. But uh, you have a physical material world, certainly, uh, and you also, in his view, have the world of human minds, um, which, which is the repository of, of uh, subjective thought, but you also have an intersubjective objective knowledge that exists as a third, what he calls a third world or, or world three. Um, and that the, there you have an interesting interplay between those three distinct processes. In his view, you cannot fully reduce uh, world three to world one, you cannot, in other words, reduce the world of objective ideas to the world of matter and physics. Um, but also in his view, world three, the, the, the world of objective ideas, do not exist without world one. Every time you have ideas, they're either held within the flesh, flesh and blood of a human brain, which is a material force, or they're put into words on paper, or on computer digital form, uh, or they're embodied in artwork or architecture or landscaping or some other way of uh, materially encoding those ideas. So ideas, although they are distinct and can be treated 
as a separate ontological category in his later work, in his work in the 1960s and early 1970s. Um, for Popper, there is always this close association with material embodiments for those ideas or those idea um, carriers. So, so books, etc., are material forces, even though the, um, the, the ideas may be distinct from, from the paper and the ink that uh, in, encodes them. Um, so, so I think, you know, I, I just, just controversially trying to pick up on, on one other of those themes that you spoke with, I spoke on at the very beginning, I, I did want to, to want to talk on that briefly, um, his, his connection with spiritual, um, what, what you would refer to as spirituality. So those are a couple of the elements that, that I wanted to talk about. I can very briefly, um, if you wanted to see some of this work, uh, may I share my screen with that, with that work just for a second? Am I able to yeah. do that? Yes, okay. You can I, share. I, okay, let's see if, uh, I, and I just briefly want to show you some images. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. So, so just so that um, I, I wanted to show that you know this this is what I've been talking about the other side of the um, volumes one and two, um, which I think are still Popper's best written work, well worth anyone who is not familiar with that um, to to read. I, I wanted to briefly, if this screen uh, changes, just give you my contact information, a little bit about who I am, and just to to kind of round out the picture. I'm not going to go through the whole, although you might see there's 29 slides on this PowerPoint. I'm not going to show you more than two more. Uh, so there's my contact information. Here is uh, an example of a book that I wrote on Karl Popper and the reconstruction of progressive politics. It goes into a, a large amount more detail than I have been able to talk about in the past half hour. And um, just to give you again a little bit of background, I organize an international symposium on Karl Popper's, uh, the 20th anniversary of Karl Popper's death. Uh, went, was, went uh, for three days, and um, many of the um, presentations, many of the uh, episodes, starting with the introductory episode where George Soros uh, provided an, a brief introduction to the symposium, those are available on YouTube, and I can send you the reference if you want to. So just wanted to give you a little bit of background before I um, turn over to discussion, but again, if anybody wants to directly contact me, more than happy to hear from you. And here is my email address for anyone who wants to reach out and follow up or continue the argument. So I'm going to stop sharing, even though I've got uh, another um, well, large number of slides. I, I don't think I need to, <laughs> to, to reach those. I think I have probably talked now for about 40 minutes. I believe you would like us to move to a, a, a conversation. So thank you. So thank you so much, Professor Benetch, for your insightful presentations. So we can uh, cultivate our conversations further. Very quickly, you refer to the whole evolutionary dimension. And uh, in your uh, book, you also have a theme of evolutionary epistemology. And if you could kindly elaborate this a bit. Okay. Well, I think um, the the first thing to say is that evolutionary epistemology is not sociobiology, as it was once called. Um, uh, Popper is not about the selfish gene or anything of that nature. I, I, I think you wanted me to immediately respond. Is that right? Um, yeah. Yes. You, you, and okay, then so, we so, would have to Okay, so 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 I, I think um, so. So long as you recognise that when we talk about evolutionary epistemology, we're not talking about sociobiology or um, the selfish gene, uh, Dawkins' theory, or, or um, um, Edward Wilson's theory. Uh, I, I think we're, we're on on good grounds. Um, by evolutionary epistemology, he means a couple of things. One of which is indeed this uh, gradual development of what Popper ultimately calls well three, which is objective knowledge, and um, that there is, as a result, perhaps of biological and chemical e evolution, uh, ultimately the development of a capacity for consciousness, and then a capacity for whatever consciousness exists to create a, um, a, a kind of objective set of ideas that can be, for example, 
recorded on a cave drawing or perhaps, and, and, and I think uh, sometimes Potter's examples are rather absurd here, but I, so I don't necessarily agree with him um, here. Um, but there is also this, the, you know, he also goes, talks about the possibility of a beaver's den being uh, an, an objective expression of the knowledge that they have. And the idea of an objective, so, so you have, uh, so you move from biochemical processes to consciousness to these objective expressions of consciousness. Now I have a great problem with that line of progression, not least because I think it's very difficult to demonstrate the autonomy of consciousness until you have what, what he refers to as objective knowledge. I think uh, um, objective knowledge is clearly um, irreducible in many respects to biochemical processes, but arguably consciousness is just initially another biochemical process. In other words, it enables a bird that has uh, a brain and an eye to somehow or other apprehend that they're about to be attacked by a predator. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's in other words, an enhancement of mechanisms that you can see in purely biochemical terms. Once you get objective ideas, then you introduce a, uh, a, a, a concept that cannot be easily reduced. And indeed, arguably, in turn, brains uh, or minds achieve some level of, of autonomy from purely biochemical processes because they are also influenced by, and to some extent, controlled by these other ideas. Um, so, so I'm not, so, so um, Popper's evolutionary epistemology should not be understood, I think, in a linear uh, deterministic uh, progression, number one. Number two, uh, there are problems with it, as you would expect, because Popper himself indeed is a theorist of fallibilism, so you would expect <laughs> his own theory to be fallible and indeed to be wrong in many respects. Um, and then uh, so, so <laughs> I would say that uh, often people try to to uh, worship Popper, but I, I certainly don't. Uh, and I, you know, I don't think he's uh, he's somebody who who uh, avoided mistakes. He's made many of them, and we should be able to criticize all such mistakes and learn from them and improve upon them. Um, so the other element of uh, evolutionary epistemology is this concept of the growth of knowledge, that human beings and animals um, there there is. I mean, he once said that there is a, a, a kind of connection between the amoeba and Einstein, that we see a progression insofar as we see any progression. And this is Popper, who still, still claims not to be a historicist. He sees a progression in the growth of knowledge, in the gradual development of knowledge, often through conjectures and through genetic mutations that simply failed. You know, I mean, we, uh, so you can think of a genetic mutation as a kind of conjecture a kind of random um, variation on the patterns that were previously practiced successfully. So you have a genetic variation. Will this work? Well, let's try it out. And so, you know, those that survive uh, presumably were successful and those that were not, um, well, that, that their, their conjecture was shown to be flawed. Fortunately, human beings, unlike the amoeba and earlier animal organisms, do not need to die because we have wrong ideas. <laughs> I mean, this, especially after the Holocaust and the world wars and the continuous threat of uh, global mutually assured destruction, I think we should put aside that, that notion that we have to eradicate the people who get it wrong. But what we can do, I think, with the idea of, of evolutionary epistemology and objective thought, as he calls it, and perhaps it's not the best term, or people can misunderstand that, he's not saying it's necessarily true, but what we can do is we can criticize it. It's no longer part of our body. It is exosomatic, as he describes it. It is, in a sense, because you've written it down or you've encoded it on in, in a computer or you've produced an artwork or a building for, for architecture, in other words, uh, others can see it and others can criticize it. And indeed, you yourself can step back from your own creation and recognize its flaws. You are not entangled and ensnared. You shouldn't take it personally. So we can have an, a rational argument without it becoming an ad hominem argument. It can be about ideas rather than about the people who are advancing those ideas. I think academics have a long way to go <laughs> in that particular matter. They, they still tend to um, often be very attached to their ideas and to take it personally when their ideas are rejected. But, but that was Popper's 
pr approach, this notion that we are, so to speak, estranged from our ideas. He once described our ideas as our children, and we expect our children to grow up and often to begin to develop the characteristics that we wouldn't want them to develop. Well, that's the case with ideas. Uh, there are all sorts of unintended consequences every time you come up with a concept that we subsequently will repudiate. Popper, to give you one quick example, Popper criticizes Oppenheimer and Sakharov, the two main American and Soviet designers of their atomic weapons, and in Sakharov's case of the hydrogen bomb, Arguably, they did not foresee the long-term consequences, the unfortunate consequences. Both of them became critics of their government's further development of their weaponry. Sakharov, as you know, ultimately fell so foul, foul of the Soviet government that he was treated as a pariah. And um, uh, likewise, Oppenheimer was excluded after the Manhattan Project was, was kind of marginalized in American nuclear physics. But in a sense, you know, both of them were so mesmerized by their intellectual creation initially, but then became critical of the unforeseen and unintended consequences. And I think that's the case with almost all ideas. We are not attached to them. They are outside of our bodies. They are separate from us. We can criticize our own ideas, and certainly others can, and show the shortfall within them. That's the great promise of Karl Popper, this approach of rational criticism that is not ad hominem criticism. Human beings do not need to die for their ideas. We can let the ideas die all by themselves. Actually, ideas don't die. They just get relegated to a, the furthest back shelf of, of, a, of a library or an archive. But anyway, sorry, there's, there's my answer to your, your initial question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Philip. So I can see one uh, hand. Uh, so yes, uh, Kang uh, from Korea wants to ask something. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, uh, thank you. I appreciate this lecture. Uh, my name is Kang Kyung Hoon. I'm from Korea, and I have a uh, one question. Uh, I know perspicacion, uh, but I wonder. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how perspicacion adapt in uh, social or political progress, or society, mm. or, or politics? I'm not sure I caught the key term. I pers perspicacion, you said, or uh, was that perspective, or do you mean participation? Uh, how can perspicacion adapt in society or politics field? Okay, so, so if, if I've correctly understood the question, um, it was about participation. Is that what you meant? Are people taking part in politics? And, and is, is, if, if I've correctly heard you and understood, or, or maybe I misheard the word. No, so I was if, if, if I may uh, interpret, he's asking how falsification can work in the field of politics. Okay. I'm, I'm yes, still, yes. Okay. Po, 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 could, sorry, could someone type it in the chat? Because I'm not sure what I, that I correctly heard the uh, word. How po, falsification? Falsification. Well, I, I apologize. I'm, I miss I, these. These headphones are not great, <laughs> and I and I'm uh, right in front of an air conditioner, so I do do apologize. Okay, how can falsification uh, uh, work in politics? Not very well, uh, and I'll tell you what uh, my my view, if I may, and that is that. Um, uh, so so falsification is a way of. Uh, testing something that is in, uh, that has an empirical claim, an empirical basis, right? And so, um, you know, you you can uh, effectively falsify a theory, or at least you can tentatively falsify a theory. In the logic of scientific discovery, in 1934, Popper said, um, "The the um, I, 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 no need to apologize. I'm I'm right in, I'm right in front of a um, air conditioner. I think I I'm mishearing." Quite a bit, uh, and I'm old, so so the, the two combined. Um, so in 1934, Popper said, you know, even if a theory is falsified, it's not conclusively or definitely or or permanently falsified. You can always discover that that the for, the uh, falsifying incident, so to speak, was misinterpreted, or that the data was corrupted, or something of that nature. A theory is not therefore entirely or definitely falsified. It's just for the time set aside, and you fo focus on other more fruitful theories that uh, have not yet been disconfirmed. 
I think. So that's that's the first point. In in the area of politics, it becomes much more difficult. Are there th are there empirical claims that are associated with a uh, a theory, or is it more in the nature of an ethical claim, which is not necessarily falsifiable? I um, mean, you can look at certain of the consequences of a policy or certain consequences of an ethical set of values, and you can say these have led to undesired or unforeseen consequences, and you can try to convince people uh, on the basis of their conscience not to continue to support this particular theory. But the chances are that at the end of the day, some will continue to adhere to a theory that you believe is uh, contrary to the evidence that you're able to point to. Um, you know, so po in, in politics, falsification is different from the way it might work in the physical sciences. That's number one. Number two, there is a sense in which Although I want to avoid stressing the analogy here, it's just an analogy, uh, but, but there is a sense in which um, where there are elections, voters, ordinary people are empowered to say which set of leaders, which unfortunately we're still voting for leaders as opposed, to, I, I would much rather have a more participatory approach, but the rejection of, of uh, parties and their policies is to some extent a um, vote of disapproval. Now, that's not a perfect analogy. It's not falsification as Popper would say it would be for scientific theories or for empirical theories. It's more a, um, a, a intermediate testing. Um, however, if I may draw your attention, if you've read the Logic of Scientific Discoveries, I'm sure many people have who are interested in his methodology, you'll notice that Popper uses uh, even for science, a kind of analogy with a jury system um, that <laughs> effectively the scientific community as a jury um, uh, evaluates the theory. There is perhaps analogy in that respect with the, the political process. There is a sense in which um, some people are so convinced that a policy and a set of leaders have shown to be erroneous. Now, but let, let, let's just step back just very, very briefly. Popper's view of democracy. Uh, I think Popper's view of democracy, like his view of science, like his falsificationist view of science, is a negative view in this sense. First and foremost, an emphasis on negative liberty, freedom from state interference is important, especially with regard to freedom of speech and freedom of conscience. But there's also negative in the sense that politics is about rejection of bad leaders rejection of incompetent or inept or otherwise um, uh, leaders who are no longer to be preferred. You rarely have the opportunity to select the good leader or the, in fact, you probably never have the chance to really uh, select a good leader or a good policy. What you're doing is in elections, effectively evaluating the evidence as you as an individual see it of, of the performance of the previous administration or other, other politicians. So it's always a retrospective judgment call uh, on this. Um, I have some misgivings about some aspects of Popper's views on democracy, in particular, his rejection of changes to the voting system. I am very much in favor of single transferable voting in a multi-member constituency, such as they have in the Republic of Ireland. I would introduce all sorts of other changes that Popper uh, rejected. I think he was mistaken in doing so, but then that's good for fallibilists to have, you know, a recognition that each of our theories may well be quite wrong. So I hope, uh, my, my apologies for the initial mishearing of that. And, and so. Uh, Thank you for your answer. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other French? Was just Yes. Uh, Yes, please ask your question. Yes. Can I ask? Uh, sure, sure. Yes. Well, I want yes, to. Yes, Luke. I want to remark something from uh, that I read from Amartya Sen. He studied uh, starvation, uh, like from uh, in China, and his conclusion was that uh, actually Mao and the leaders thought that they had enough food, but they didn't. And it was because there was no free press, and that this was a cause of starvation, because they. The, the people who had to report how much rice there was in every part of China, 
they saw that everybody else had enough and, and produced enough. And so they said, oh, if we, if we now say that we don't have anything, uh, we, will be, we will be seen as bad workers. So they lied, but actually they all lied because they all thought that everybody else was doing fine. And in the end, they didn't have any rice because they thought they had rice, but they didn't have anything. And this is something that free speech, actually, according to Amartya Sen, in a democracy, he says the starvation uh, is much less likely to happen for because of this reason. And you need a free press and so on. It does help somewhat. Uh, it's a kind of uh, a kind of falsification, but not a real falsification. But it helps, I think. Yes. Okay. Did you hear Thank me? Thank you. Yes. 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 I agree with with most of what you said. Some of it, of course, can also still happen in the command structures of Western corporations. So having a free press doesn't guarantee that, and all sorts of intellectual propriety and uh, property and all sorts of non-disclosure agreements limit the exposure of the errors and the incompetence and sometimes the outright lying by various corporations. So, but yes, you can certainly have that still in, in but yes, it's even more the case in, in heavily centralized command economies. Actually, I agree about corporations. I've been an accountant all my life. It's the idea that there is uh, efficiency in corporations. It's not true. Eh? <laughs> you can see, yeah. okay, but that's another question. Yes, thank you. Any other tricks? Uh, please indicate me in the chat box or uh, may I invite uh, Professor Gyan Gului? Yes, thank you very much. Excuse me, I have some problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very interesting. And uh, uh, well, I I agree with uh, with all the points because um, I think that uh, uh, one of the points which uh, at least most impressed me while while reading Popper was uh, the the poverty of historicism. That is the his criticism of historicism because uh, it is interesting that it's 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 so really a thing which. Uh, at least we, when I read, for instance, Hegel or other exponents of historicism, was not so clear that is, I read, I studied the, the work, but Popper illuminated me as regards the, the, the presence of a really deterministic vision of history in their vision. That is, that actually it is perhaps really the will to impose a, a determination of history which moves these interpreters to interpret history in this way. That is, it is always, there is always this uh, finality to, uh, to tell uh, a priori, so to speak, uh, what history will be, what history will do, and how history will tend. And this is was in in the lecture was uh, in the lecture of the poverty of historicism was really illuminating for me. So, yes, I would say this first of all, and second, uh, I think that uh, as regards uh, his interpretation of Plato, uh, well, it is true that uh, the state, the state, the, the state, the formal government of Plato is uh, not a liberal one, not a democratic one, one not at all. I had the impression while reading the first part of the Open Society and East Enemies that uh, Popper was uh, a little bit perhaps influenced by also the some aspects of national socialism while reading Plato because uh, some, uh, if I am not mistaken, because I read the work some years ago, so I am not, and I have not here with me in this moment, unfortunately, so that, that I cannot control. But I had the impression that he applied uh, some points of the National Socialist programs and actions on the thought of Plato. Uh, in spite of that, I think that well, tendentially is is right about his judgment on, on Plato and on his on the lack of uh, of liberties which we have to cope with while reading and judging 
the the the, the state proposal of later. Yes, this yes. I have the impression uh, if uh, more I read some works of Plato that uh, it is true Plato does not accept uh, the, the idea at all of fallibilism. On the contrary, he wants to find a, a science which is not fallibilist at all. Uh, I have the impression that Plato is, so to speak, moved also in his thought, not only by a false conception of science or a conception of uh, of absolute science, which tells the truth and no more, but that is conception of science is uh, still a religious one. That is that he wants to have this uh, science, which is that this knowledge, which is not fallible, because science and knowledge have for Plato the duty and should serve, should be function, functional to the aim of bringing the individual to another dimension. That is to leave the, the individual, to, to let the individual leave progressively the sense dimension and to transfer him at least mentally to another dimension. And therefore he needs really a not calibrist at all science because his project of transforming the individual is an absolute one, which of course has dangers in the in it and also very great problems anyway thank you very much it was really very very interesting thank you thank you can, can i can i come back uh to, with comments or is that okay yep uh, so, so so if i may um so so i i think that's a very interesting set of uh comments i think popper got plato wrong <laughs> in many respects uh although you're right about what he said um, and, and there is that reading within Plato. I, I see Plato's early work in particular, um, and indeed all the dialogues up to and including the Republic, which is roughly midway through his life uh, as a writer, as much more ad adherent to a, fall a fallibilist and a, um, a, a Socratic approach. I think the Republic, for example, ultimately comes to, you know, first of all, the idea of philosopher kings are, is only introduced midway through it, line 473c, uh, which is halfway through the, the entire volume. And by the, within two further books of the Republic, uh, he has rejected the philosopher king and the ideal Republic, the beautiful regime of that. I think there is this introduction of this concept because the people who are depicted as part of the conversation in the Republic are people who are wedded to a an aristocratic and uh, Critian approach. I mean, Glaucon and Adimantus, along with Plato, were part of the family of Critias and Charmides. Uh, they were part of the aristocratic and tyrannically um, inclined uh, ruling class within Athens, who did not like democracy, who wanted to supplant democracy, and um, who tried to recruit Socrates to their side. And Socrates resisted, and we have evidence outside of Plato's writings to indicate Pla uh, Socrates' resistance to Critias. There is the early dialogue, the, 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 the third dialogue that uh, Plato wrote called the Charmides, in which effectively there is a confrontation between Socrates and Critias's infallibilist uh, approach. You know, he believed that he could have an absolute criteria for the truth. That's an infallibilist criteria. He thought that because he would have that infallibilist criteria, his infallibilism should enable him to rule perfectly, that his regime could be an authoritarian regime equipped with a science that was unable to make an error and therefore would be a perfect centralized authoritarian government. What happens in both the Charmides, the third or fourth dialogue of Plato and the Republic, is that that position, which is favored by some within the audience, uh, is undermined. So I think Popper got it wrong by thinking that Plato was simply uttering this, um, this view in order to support the view. I think what he was doing was uttering the view in order to subvert it, to show once you put it out in its strongest form, how it is filled with error. So that's the first thing I would say. Second thing is, I think you're absolutely right that there is in Platonism, as opposed to in Plato, an authoritarian tendency. So I asked myself, why was uh, Popper prepared to spend so much time attacking Plato? Uh, 
and you, I think you're partly right that some of the ideas directly overlap with the activities of certain socialists. There were authoritarian socialists. There were Lenin, there was Lenin and Leninism, which had a kind of centralized vanguard of, of philosophers who were meant to lead the working class to, to the land because the working class couldn't, you know, Lenin, one of the, Lenin's earlier uh, statements was if the working class, uh, if, if socialism is left to the working class, it would take them 500 years. All they will be able to achieve is a trade union consciousness is what he said. And therefore you need a vanguard party. In other words, a group of philosophers to lead them. So I think you're right that by attacking Platonism, he is attacking parts of the left. But I think you also have to look at what else he's attacking. Popper grew up in Austria when Austria was being overtaken and had his democracy in Austria had never really been stabilized from, right from 1918 when the, the First Republic was introduced, it was undermined by the Catholic Church, amongst others. The Catholic Church, in a sense, was something that Popper, you know, it was off limits to Popper's criticism. He didn't want to cause offense to those who were uh, religious. And so how do you attack the um, the dominance and the theories and the uh, the infallibilism. Talk about infallibilism. The, you know, papal infallibilism is is the, the, the centerpiece of the Catholic Church. Um, how do you do that without attacking Catholicism? Well, you attack it in this roundabout way. <laughs> you you are polite to to Christians generally, but you're attacking Platonism. I think, and none of this gets picked up by Western readers who don't understand, especially English readers who are so removed from the situation in Central Europe in between the First and the Second World War. I mean, in Italy, in uh, Austria, in Croatia, in Slovakia, in Spain, in Portugal, all of these countries gave rise to authoritarian regimes that are, to a very large extent, ended up emulating Mussolini's fa form of fascism, not Hitler's form of fascism, which also started in Bavaria, by the way, uh, um, but, but and were all sanctified by agreements with the Catholic Church were uh, modeled on an, a leader principle that was very much, um, I think, endorsed by the established authorities. And uh, so, so I think, you know, more is going on in uh, Popper's criticism of Platonism than a simple academic exercise criticizing Plato. He's also criticizing the the uh, incorporation of platonic models, as you say, into things like Leninism and certain left-wing approaches, but also um, subtly and perhaps too subtly for many uh, English and, and American readers, um, and a, a criticism of, of the cultural underpinning, the, 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 the church's underpinning of what were described at the time as, quote, clerico-fascist regimes in uh, Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, in Austria, in Croatia and ultimately in Slovakia. Father Tiso is the leader of the Slovakian uh, regime, interestingly enough. Um, so, so I think that's that's also what's going on. But but uh, so so I, in my book, um, if you ever get to read my uh, Viennese Socrates, uh, which is on Karl Popper and the reconstruction of uh, progressive politics, which I think Luke has the um, the link to. I, I don't have the link available, but I think you're able to put it maybe in the chat. Anybody wants to download it from where uh, Luke. Has that Luke? Are you able to put that into the chat? That that link. Oh, so that that it, I, I I address precisely that uh, element in various parts of the chapters and in um, in chapter seven in particular. I I suggest that there's an alternative approach that Popper missed. I think Popper was wrong. Popper the fallibilist was wrong on this, <laughs> but he's he's wrong in a very interesting way. I think we can learn a lot from him <laughs> in in this way. Oh, thank you. Uh, Minty Pradhanji, please ask your question. And I would request uh, uh, Professor Philip to kindly note down this question and then you can respond at the last. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. 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 Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Philip Willis for his uh, very enlightened uh, presentation about the I mean, no, that different realm of the subject. So, Professor Philip was telling about that rejection of violence and the ethical commitment and all these points. Uh, you know, when you take it as a progressive politics in the cultural progressivism and the economic progressivism and all these things, it comes to my mind one word is synchronicity. 
so the synchronicity is just shifting from the head to heart you know you become ori less and become light hearted and full of joy it is about encountering more meaningful coincidences so actually synchronicity permits across the whole spectrum of human kind if it is understood the universal love and magnanimity of the human spirit all these petty differences can be actually dispelled quickly so just i wanted to know it is a just relatable you know not just between two but the spiral thread between it which binds the all total humanity so i have very simple question actually did he believe in synchronicity and uh, and put some light on that and one more thing is put some light on you know what were his views uh, were on feminism and thank you so much for the opportunity do you want me to answer now or do you want me to wait for another question please wait for another question so we can spend some time yes any other friend hello randeep yes. as friends uh, as friends are gathering strength <laughs> so i am uh, professor benes i am thinking about another theme uh, you know you referred to the whole issue of ethics and how popper's work both in politics and critic of positivism is part of his whole ethical journey i am thinking also about the dimension of aesthetics here given his love for music you know what is the connection between ethics and aesthetics if any in popper and to think about progressive politics in the context of both ethics and aesthetics what would be a new kind of aesthetics which would be a support for progressive politics here given holocaust and nazism what david harvey calls as the aesthetics of empowerment is a different kind of aesthetics where it is an aesthetics of domination and killing but a different kind of aesthetics of sympathy of fellow feeling that minoti was referring to so this is my first query the second query is about transcendence and uh, you know what is uh, given uh, popper's work on philosophy of science and and third very quickly is this polyvalism this polyvalistic way of thinking in a cross cultural way in a cross civilizational way how it can interact with other modes of thinking like for example in jainism there is a very important way of thinking called multi valued logic which is different from the binary logic i am true and you are false and that is also fallibilistic in a very profound way i request your consideration for the need for cross cultural dialogue and realization in realizing this path of fallibilism thank you uh, professor giri any other friend uh thank you professor philip it was a very okay. enriching uh, so my also uh, i also want to ask also want to ask you one question about uh, you know uh, when we think about uh, popper's uh, uh, approach of understanding reality then uh, we can see he is uh, more close to have philosophical orientation rather than scientific orientation and uh, he also considered that his conceptualization of falsification is a kind of guideline or a kind of rule of thumb or he considered himself sometime it may be right or sometime it may be wrong so when we th- think about a kind of uh, political institution uh, in his writing of uh, conjectures and refutations he wrote that how can we organize our political institution so that uh, uh, so that bad or uh, incompetent rulers whom we uh, try not to get but whom we so easily might get all the same uh, 
cannot do too much damage so i want to understand his whether uh, his conception or or the understanding of tolerance of course it a paradox of tolerance tolerance so how this idea of paradox of tolerance can be uh, you know uh, useful for theorizing our existential crisis for that matter legitimacy crisis you know because you know as you know liberals preach tolerance are liberal therefore committed to tolerating those uh, for that matter naji party or al qaeda you know isis so for that matter if you bring uh, this um, uh, question and if you can help us to un- make understand that would be absolutely good thank you can, can i start with you and work back if that's okay um can i start yeah. with the points that you just re- so um uh, part because my notes are really disorganized so I, i think it's easier for me to trace my way back so um the, the i i think the um the the paradox of toleration is is problematic is a problematic uh, area within popper's thought not least because he at some point seems to recognize that there will be a need to curb liberty for a group that might be growing in numbers and threatening democracy and threatening freedom and that one should not tolerate that i mean he's thinking in terms of the nazi party and perhaps the communist party but i think he's mainly thinking in terms of the hard right um, and various nationalists and various um, intolerant groups that would suppress other religions or suppress other approaches or would try to exterminate certain people on the basis of racial or ethnic or uh, or perhaps sexual or, or orientation basis so um at some point he's suggesting that a liberal society to maintain its freedom has to suppress um this is not an unproblematic uh claim by popper and i have struggled with it because i do not know how we can make that decision when we will know that a party that is still small and growing is such a threat that you should prohibit it which is what the the british for example have done with a number of far right groups they have banned a group called national action because of its fascist connections and its racist attacks on on various communities um and so uh, you can certainly criminalize violent behavior unlawful behavior but should you ban the group itself which exists as a political organization a propagandist organization um before it 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 is genuinely more than a handful of people and um, popper's approach seems to tolerate the suppression of the intolerant <laughs> so, you know think about that um but but yes you're right i mean the, the there is a desire for us to tolerate other positions to accept other positions i think popper's position is pluralistic and this goes back to to one of the earlier uh, points by by uh, by the, uh, the moderator i think um that you know that, that there if you have different cultures and different perspectives it is very helpful popper speaks at various points both in the open society and in the myth of the framework about the need to have a a kind of culture clash a uh, a a a certain dissonance between points of view that enables us to see how parochial some of our views are the way different um uh, different groups of people in the ancient world for example in different locations had very different conceptions of god god it seems always resembled the the facial and racial characteristics of the people <laughs> who who imagined god so god was always made in a, in the image of the believer in that sense uh so so much for for man being made in the image of god but but uh, but quite quite the contrary so that um he, we can learn from um those differences and we should tolerate and accept and recognize the value of um those differences so there is a, a more than just a toleration there is a pluralism an active desire for multiple ways to coexist um so so that i think that was the the, the last part but the, the other part of your question i think was about designing polit- political institutions so that they enable us to get rid of bad leaders well popper didn't get too much into what we need to do <laughs> um and i am rather frustrated by the limitations of popper on this point um a he, uh, and his view seems to be you know very much the first past the post uh, 
single member district systems that we are familiar with in many parliamentary democracies and in the United States to some extent. Um, but I am much more interested in, in having electoral systems that are reformed so that they better reflect the population and also enable um, groups of people who may become disaffected and may simply not turn out to vote to actually want to go and vote. I think a voting system uh, for representation is much better than a delegated system where we try to meet in small groups. You know, the idea that, that some uh, Marxists have long championed that get rid of parliamentary democracy and have instead um, a system of delegates elected from local uh, meetings. The trouble with that approach, that meeting, that delegation approach, is that whenever it has been tried, if it is to fully and effectively manage the affairs of a complex society, you ultimately need meetings almost every day. And every time I have seen this put into effect, including you know, in the ancient Athens type example, a tiny, only a tiny fragment of the eligible members of the community turn up to, to participate in those discussions and to instruct the delegates. So the delegate system seems no better than in a parliamentary democracy for ensuring representation. In fact, quite the contrary, it can be among the worst. The, the typical turnout for a, an Athenian assembly, for example, was 6,000 individuals out of a much larger citizen population, male citizen population. The turnout in Portugal when they tried something similar to this was again, outside of the initial revolutionary fervor in 1974-75, it became minuscule amounts of individuals turning up um, to, the, to those assemblies because they had other commitments that they needed to attend to. Um, so I think a representative electoral democracy is necessary. I think we need to look at better systems of representation uh, and, in, and in particular different voting systems. Uh, I am very interested in, in ideas for proportional representation using a single transferable voting system. It's worked beautifully in the Republic of Ireland. It's produced stable governments that are much more uh, responsive to, to uh, individuals. And there are a number of other changes that we can also look at. Um, so turning, if I go, going through this in, in reverse order, if I can now turn to some of the other questions uh, ra raised by the moderator, and I'm very, very happy to, to have those. Um, let's see, so, so there was a question on, on fallibilism um, and, and culture. And I, I think, again, this, um, you know, so, so I, Popper made a distinction between empirical science and metaphysics. And he does not dismiss metaphysics. Metaphysics is necessary. Um, you know, every, every um, scientific program is based on a metaphysical research program. He used the phrase meta metaphysical research program um, in the 1950s. It was then adopted and uh, transformed by the work of Lakatos later. But um, the, the idea that we can do science without a, an underpinning of metaphysics, it seems to me, is um, is wrong, but the metaphys and metaphysics is not susceptible to falsification. I mean, you can say that there are good metaphysics and bad metaphysics. You can distinguish between a metaphysics that is coherent and a metaphysics that is riddled with contradiction. You can perhaps um, find all sorts of other logical flaws or all sorts of other um, incompatibilities with metaphysics that you like as opposed to a, a form of metaphysics that you don't, um, but, the, but it is not possible to falsify metaphysics. Uh, falsification in, in, the, in the Popperian sense of, of having empirical disconfirmation, okay? Um, metaphysics is also not based on um, an inductivist method, nor, and Popper rejects inductivism anyway, but, but you, you certainly can't have inductivism in, in, uh, um, in, in metaphysics. Popper's approach, uh, in empirical science is a, what you might call a counter-inductivist approach, an attempt to find evidence that contradicts the proposition so that you can show that the, the, the claim the hypothesis is false. It's very rare that you can do that in non-scientific areas, but you can try. You can certainly look at that. Um, what you can do, however, is boost conversations between different metaphysics. And here again, we come back to pluralism and culture clash and the, the value of going beyond toleration to a recognition of the value of 
different perspectives and different approaches that you have. Again, if I can then go back to the next uh, previous question, which was on transcendence. Um, I think uh, there was a question of whether uh, Popper um, accepted uh, transcendence as part of, uh, of this. And I think uh, here, um, so, so, so can, can, if, if I understand transcendence, other than in the religious sense, um, th th there is, I think, a sense in which we cease to be simply motivated by chemical biological impulses. So that, that we uh, often are subject to the rule of certain ideas that we have accepted, be they religious or be they moral or be they um, political. You know, one can, one, can, one can see all sorts of ways in which in that sense, um, we are not simply that bundle of flesh and blood and, uh, and uh, uh, genetic impulses, but rather often we are orientating our policy in a different way. So people sometimes fast and they fast near to death. Uh, probably their bodies are telling them that they are doing things which are um, le leading them in, in a, a direction that is not healthy nutritionally, but they do this because of all sorts of additional values being important to them and effectively being able to override and therefore transcend in that sense, that view. But I think you can also be, there is transcendence in the cultural sense as well. You, you can step outside of your own narrow experience by experiencing other cultures, not just by, by uh, travel, but by reading and by, by encountering through formats such as we have today. Um, the previous question to that was, you had mentioned uh, critical positivism, which I'm not sure what, what you mean by that. He certainly wasn't, in my view, a, a positivist in any sense, critical or otherwise. And then you wanted a question on uh, the connection between uh, ethics and aesthetics. Let me, if I may, just very briefly say that um, Pop Popper's view of aesthetics is that there is, to a very large extent, our tastes will differ and are culturally influenced. And by having a plurality of tastes, you will have a plurality of ethics and also of aesthetics, I think. Um, and, and that is healthy, I, I believe. Uh, there isn't a single eth aesthetic any more than there is a single uh, ethic for him. Maybe we can come back to that in discussion. I think you're running out of time. So let me quickly turn to the very first question, set of questions uh, that I had, which were related to the rejection of violence an asynchronicity um, uh, uh, and connected to that was the question of whether Popper had a view of the universality of the human spirit. So long as we can disentangle the word spirit from religious connotations, the answer is yes. Um, there, there is in Popper a consistent humanitarianism, a vision that we are all part of one human race. Um, and, and I think that is absolutely uh, central to his approach um, that there is, so to speak, as Marx once adopted the vision that nothing that is human is alien to me, uh, that there is a sense in which um, you know, a complete rejection of, of racism, a complete rejection of, of the nationalist divisions of uh, the world into different uh, factions, um, and instead a recognition that there is just one humanity here. Um, I'm trying to read my notes on the very last point. Um, oh, on, on views on family was the very last point that was asked. Uh, what's his views on family? Well, huh, now there is an interesting area. Papa himself did not have any children, did not write really on family, as far as I can see. But there is a sense in which family is an area in which laissez-faire has to prevail. Uh, that, that in effect, in, in this sense, that the state should not mandate a particular pattern of families, a pa pattern of relationships among parents or a pattern of uh, parenting. Indeed, if the state were ever to do that, as arguably Plato uh, endeavored to do, um, the result would be disastrous. The result would be that an alleged science of parental nurturing would become uh, uh, established and imposed without it ever actually being um, a, 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 a something that would work. And it's very difficult to test. Arguably by having a plurality of families, you, have, you ensure a plurality of cultures, a plurality of approaches and values, and have a very healthy um, dialogue among, uh, within, within adult society. Um, 
arguably by allowing parents some significant difference, so long as you can protect the child against violence, against being harmed, um, the, the parental differences can reveal different approaches to parenting, and we may learn which approaches are more prone to error and which are not. I mean, uh, whereas if we establish a kind of state paternalism, which took over the parental function, I think we have a strong risk of, of institutionalizing an authoritarian pattern of uh, possibly wrong-headed, you know, erroneous parenting instead. I hope that last point answers the question that was raised. Please correct me if I am wrong as I end up the end. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Philip. It was really very enriching, very insightful session. And uh, your lecture invites us to think something very uh, deeply about uh, the whole uh, understanding, whole conceptualizing process within Karl Persson, theory, philosophy. Uh, so with this word, may I invite uh, Mriti Pradhan to kindly offer the vote of thanks. Thank you, Randir. Um, I, Minati Pradhan, on behalf of uh, Sodhya Sahachakra and the Vishwanidam Center for Asian Blossoming, um, Asian Blossoming, I like. I would like to thank all the participants so, in one, our webinar. One request, one request, Minati, you may like to open your video, Professor. The, the video is on. <laughs> video is on. on okay. okay. Thank our chief speaker, Professor Philip Venice, for his very deep and uh, insightful presentation. We are deeply grateful, sir. And we are also deeply grateful for you to, you have answered all our queries one by one and in very detail. And thank you so much, sir. I thank our professor, our moderator, Professor Anand Kumar Giri, for arranging different subjects for us to learn and uh, you know dig deep into different realm of uh, the knowledge so i also thank professor lucas stellin for his uh, very valuable inputs and the being present with us and thank you sir thank you for everything and i thank professor ganluigi as, as always his uh, valuable inputs and attending our all webinars and being our co-traveler and i also thank kang kunero for his questions and i also thank all the participants who were presented in our zoom platform and as well as our youtube and facebook platform i thank you all pardon me if i'm forgetting anybody's name i thank thank you all and thanks everyone thank you thank you very much Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so I, much. I, thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.